the uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be here in beautiful Dublin. Uh, and actually also my first time at the ISMB meeting. I feel ashamed, but I also feel very happy to uh, have the chance to enjoy this, this magnificent conference. Um, it's a pleasure for me to talk to you about uh, specialized metabolism and the biosynthetic gene clusters that encode uh, the production of these very interesting metabolites, uh, specifically made by, uh, by microbes. I'm going to focus on prokaryotes today. So as a start, I would like to, to thank the folks with whom I did the research that I'm going to present. Um, and in particular, these are the prim other primary auth authors, which are Michael Fishback, Peter Simramanchit, and, and Jan Klaassen. Uh, Michael coordinated the work and all the, the computational work was done jointly by Peter and me and Jan did uh, the experimental work that was associated with testing the hypothesis that we generated. So specialized metabolism, why is this interesting? Um, I've really been fascinated for, for years by the metabolites and the diversity, this, the chemical diversity of metabolites that microbes bacteria and fungi can produce. So if you look at the screen, you will see a number of uh, different chemical structures of well-known uh, microbial metabolites. And you'll see that these structures will all look very different. There is peptides, polyketides, terpenoids, saccharides, lots of different uh, chemical variation. And, and really there are millions of different molecules that can be made by lots of different microbes throughout the tree of life. <clears throat> And the interesting thing, the intriguing thing, is that there is clearly a genetic basis to this large molecular diversity. And all these molecules, which include a lot of molecules that we can also use uh, in daily life, like uh, antibiotics or chemotherapeutics, immunosuppressants, so a lot of clinically relevant drugs as well, that all these molecules and all the chemical variation that underlie all their functions is um, encoded in distinct units on the bacterial and fungal chromosomes. And these are biosynthetic gene clusters. So basically, in these biosynthetic gene clusters, all the genes that encode the functions to make a molecule and to transport it out of the cell and to regulate that entire procedure are grouped together, physically uh, clustered into a region on the chromosome. And that's why we call them biosynthetic gene clusters. So, of course, you can imagine that with the emergence of so many genome sequences recently, we, we, we literally have tens of thousands of microbial genome sequences now, that this really enables us to identify and discover many new molecules and potentially many new molecules that we can apply in new ways. Because we can just look into the genome and identify such a biosynthetic gene cluster and using that, in, that information, start the discovery process of uh, seeing what kind of metabolite, what kind of molecule is made by uh, the proteins encoded by these genes. So already, um, n now four years ago, we, uh, in collaboration with, amongst others, Kai Blin, who is here on the, the third row, and others from, from Tübingen and San Francisco, we launched a web server for the detection uh, accurate identification and annotation of these biosynthetic gene clusters. It's called uh, AntiSmash, and it's currently already in the, the third version. And the way that AntiSmash detects these biosynthetic gene clusters is it has a large library of profile hidden Markov models, uh, similar to the models used in, in PFAM, that are used to uh, detect specific signature genes that are uh, specific for uh, certain biosynthetic pathways, for example, for biosynthesis of polyketides or the biosynthesis of terpenoids. This can be, this can be single genes or single protein domains or specific combinations of protein domains that are uh, key and highly specific to these pathways. So, uh, if you want to know more about anti-smash, I would recommend you to go to poster N69, which Kai will be presenting uh, tonight. So. A problem with the first version of AntiSmash was that although it was incredibly good at detecting all the biosynthetic pathways that we know very well, uh, it wasn't so superb at finding novel types of biosynthetic gene clusters that make completely novel types of, of molecules. It was really mostly restricted to the well-known classes of uh, biosynthetic pathways. We hypothesized that, in fact, 
what we know is probably just a, a small part of what is out there because there are so many microbes out there and so many different um, enzymes that they can, can make to uh, generate metabolites that this is probably just the tip of the iceberg. And that's, that is why uh, <clears throat> Peter, Michael, and I joined forces and we decided to design an algorithm uh, called Cluster Finder. And this is an algorithm that is specifically aimed at detecting both known and unknown types of biothetic gene clusters. The core assumption here is that we didn't want to, uh, like in the first uh, original version of Antishmash, only look for specific signature genes, but the assumption that we used here was that the same broad superfamilies of enzymes are recurrent in very different biothetic pathways making very different molecules. So we could use the frequencies of all these uh, enzyme families, which are uh, represented by uh, PFAM domains, uh, to uh, accurately detect new uh, biosynthetic G clusters. So what we did is basically the input for this cluster find algorithm is a, a genome, which is translated from the nucleotide sequence to basically a string of PFAM domains, so a string of nucleotides translated into a string of PFAM domains. And then we used a training set of 732 biosynthetic gene clusters for lots of different types of known compounds to uh, calculate frequencies of PFAM domains inside these clusters and in other regions of the genomes that they're from. And using that, we build a hidden mark model which hovers between a biosynthetic gene cluster state and a rest of the genome state. And then you will get pro emission uh, emitted BGC probability, and we can infer the locations of the biosynthetic gene clusters from the output of the algorithm. So we use this algorithm on 1154 pro complete prokaryotic genomes across the microbial tree of life, both archaea and bacteria, uh, and we found more than 10,000 uh, biosynthetic gene clusters with. Uh, and among these were thousands of biosynthetic gene clusters that were not detected using the original version of anti-smash. So you can imagine if you find more than 10,000 biosynthetic gene clusters, where do you actually start with, with analyzing that? Because there's, there's so many, and in the end you want to go to specific molecules, and that was really a, a difficult challenge for us. So the way that we, this, we solved that in the end is to use network analysis, which uh, especially at that time was, was really still... Um, uh, really something emergent. And we basically designed a distance metric to measure the evolutionary distance between one gene cluster and another, which is based on the PFAM domain shared and their copy numbers. And the nice thing is that we, when we make such a network out of all the biosynthetic gene clusters, we can color them by uh, general biosynthetic pathway type, or if we don't know that, we can color them gray. But we, within the network, we can also display everything we know. We can put in, and you can see that as the black dots in this network, all the known biosynthetic gene clusters from which we know the chemical products. And this way, we can really very easily and, and rapidly see which part of the biosynthetic universe we have actually already uh, explored and where are really the unexplored parts that await new discoveries. And we can really target our studies on these. And what was most uh, surprising to us, in fact, was basically what we had expected when we would make this network. We expected to find that all the large uh, connected components in this network or the large uh, groups in this network would, not have, uh, would all have black dots because we expected that basically the large and taxonomically widespread groups uh, we would already know because there has been a very large community of researchers working on these uh, biosynthetic pathways. But in fact, we saw that with, throughout this network, there is a number of very large families of gene clusters um, that basically do not contain any known gene clusters. So we decided to focus on one of these groups, which is the group that is indicated there in orange and green, which um, has a mixture of a few different types of enzymes uh, that are encoded within these gene clusters. And this group was specifically taxonomically very widely uh, distributed, and that's why we went for that. So in fact, the, we found that the two family of gene clusters that we originally found there, which are, is the, the green one here and the red one here, they were actually both 
interrelated and they were related to a third family of gene clusters, which is the blue one here. And the blue one here does contain uh, two members for which we know the products. And interestingly, the uh, products, which are xanthomonas in from the bacterium, xanthomonas compestris and uh, and flex rubin from Flavobacterium johnsoni. So these compounds had actually been used as taxonomic markers. So the original authors of uh, the papers on these biosynthetic pathways had basically said, well, these pathways are extremely specific to this organism. So if we find this compound, it's got to be this organism. And the reason for that is that these, the evolutionary distances, the, in, in terms of sequence similarity, are incredibly large, so incredibly low sequence similarity, while at the same time, the architecture of the gene cluster is preserved over these long distances. So you can see here in the colored gene clusters that you see back same uh, families of enzymes in each of these gene clusters, well, the sequence similarity is sometimes as low as 15 to 20%. And Jan uh, actually heterologously expressed the E. coli and the Vibrio gene clusters and he found that the chemical structures of these molecules are remarkably similar to the ones, uh, to the ones of xanthomonidin and flexorubin. Also, the taxonomic distribution, as I said, is uh, very, not only very widespread, but also very discontinuous. And specifically, we noticed that these gene clusters and these biosynthetic pathways occur a lot in symbiotic and pathogenic organisms. And based on earlier experiments also on the xanthomonidin, uh, compound, we hypothesize that all these molecules have uh, uh, function in the protection of, of these bacteria against reactive oxygen species. And this is particularly important for bacteria that interact closely with, uh, with the eukaryotic host. <clears throat> so another discovery that was powered by ClusterFinder was made by uh, a colleague of us, uh, Mohammed, who actually used the same networking uh, methodology and uh, the, the cluster finder algorithm to look into biosynthetic gene clusters in the human microbiome. And what he found was, in fact, that in the human microbiome, there is antibiotics made. And he specifically found a gene cluster encoding this molecule, lactocillin. And if you look at the picture over here, you'll see that lactocillin is extremely similar to the molecule you'll see at the right, which is LFF571. And also the activity spectrum of the molecule is very similar as well. And LFF571 is in fact a, a, a molecule that is currently in clinical trials by Novartis as an antibiotic. So really the stuff that we take as pills is present in our own bodies. And this is really, I, I really find this, this stunning. Uh, and it was really incredible to see that yeah, the, the, the power of these, these algorithms allowed making these this kinds of exciting discoveries. So within the future, there is lots of exciting um, uh, uh, technologies also being developed within this field, especially using synthetic biology when people really try to reconstitute these biosynthetic pathways with synthetic genes to put them in a model organism. Uh, so you can take pathways from very exotic organisms you cannot even grow in the lab and put them in a pet organism to see what kind of compound it produced. Um, and this, this will really speed up the discovery of, of lots of um, very intriguing novel types of compounds. I'm really excited about this. What is also very exciting is that we might be able to build our own biosynthetic gene clusters, to build our own biosynthetic pathways and thereby build our own molecules. Uh, and we can here imitate the power of nature because when we look at the evolution of these biosynthetic gene clusters, we can in fact see that nature kind of plays Lego with these gene clusters. You'll see the groups of color genes at the bottom which correspond to specific chemical moieties uh, at the chemical structures at the top of the screen. And you'll see that nature will just take these genes and recombine them in novel ways to make new molecules. And in principle, we can imitate this in, uh, in our synthetic biology efforts. And this will be very exciting as well. And to make this possible, um, I've recently coordinated a, um, a large community initiative called MIBIG, the Minimum Information About a Biosynthetic Gene Cluster, which provides a data standard to specifically um, store the, the information linking genes to molecules and linking specific groups of genes to specific chemical moieties uh, and really update the gene cluster in a very detailed fashion. And uh, I think this really paves the way for going from the genomic analysis to uh, the synthetic engineering of new biosynthetic pathways. 
Finally, I would like to thank all my collaborators and uh, funding agencies, and I'd like to thank you for, my, for your attention. Hmm. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, you're also working on the prediction of the products because uh, you, you have now all these nice gene clusters. Uh, are there mm. some techniques to predict what is the outcome? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, of course, I am working on this. So when you look, you'll probably appreciate that there is lots of different biosynthetic gene clusters out there encoding lots of different types of molecules. And for some molecules, uh, it is now there has been a lot of algorithmic development already uh, to, for example, predict the certain specificities of enzymes that uh, either select specific chemical groups that will go into the final product and predict the order in which these chemical groups are tied together into the final molecule. And this is specifically now very well possible for peptides, specifically the non-ribosomal uh, peptides, but also for, for polyketides, for example. Um, and for the peptides, I have also recently written an algorithm that we can, in which we can use these predictions and basically couple them directly to, to mass spectrometry. So you can uh, use mass spec data and basically connect it directly to the genomic data uh, using a probabilistic algorithm to see which um, uh, observed products and which fragmented products in your mass spec data are most likely to represent a molecule made by a certain biosynthetic gene cluster. But for other biosynthetic pathways, there is still a lot of work to be done. So this is really good for finding things that are clustered. Do you have any feeling for how much interesting things made by bacteria where they have more scattered gene organization underlying the synthesis? Or is that kind of really unknown? Um, so it is known so to some extent. So I think we have now around 1,000 characterized by synthetic gene clusters from bacteria. Um, and I think there's just a few dozens in which the, basically the pathway is split over multiple genome loci. It does occur in bacteria, but it's very rare. In fungi, it happens more often, uh, and in plants, it seems to happen even more often than in fungi. There is still very unclear how frequent it is that these pathways are really completely clustered or not. Uh, so you can imagine that in the organisms where the clustering is incomplete, you might want to use um, uh, compl complementary techniques like um, evolutionary clustering of specific groups of genes or uh, co-expression of specific uh, genomic loci to tie these genomic loci together that cooperate in to basically pr produce a, a single biotic pathway.